So have you ever had a week where you open your Bible and every time you open your Bible, you struggled to really get anything? Anybody have a week like that? Okay, well, that wasn't my week this week. I had a week where every time I opened the Bible, God spoke purpose, vision. Every single time I read words of Scripture, I was encouraged. Every single time I picked up my Bible, it just came to life. And this was such an exciting week for me because God was speaking to me about purpose, my purpose, about the purpose of this church and vision for this church, and even the purpose of Bermuda and vision that God has for Bermuda. Every single time, I spent time with him. And it's been such an exciting week. Now, one of the ways in which God really spoke to me was I was listening to the debate on same-sex marriage, which, is, which was occurring in London. And while I was listening to it, I was getting discouraged because these people were hammering us. Like, they were, they were talking about Bermuda and Bermudians. Like, they were, you know, listening to it. You would think that the most backward people in the world and the most uninformed people in the world live in our country. And so I listened to it, and I was getting discouraged. And halfway through, I prayed, and then God encouraged me with this. He said, you know what? You get discouraged by stuff because you listen to them based on your story alone. So you're listening to this thing going, God, what will this mean for Bermuda? What will this mean for churches in Bermuda? What will this mean for me? And that's typically how we view things. And then here's what God encouraged me. Turn it back on and listen to it based on my story. Because here's the thing, our stories are only really relevant and powerful when they are intertwined and interlocked with his story. And oftentimes we look at the things that we are going through based on just our story and not his story. And, and thinking that the only thing that this thing is doing is affecting me negatively and not seeing how it could be affecting the kingdom of God positively. So then I listened to the very same men saying some of the very same things, and here's what I heard. I heard men in London going, there is an island in the middle of the Atlantic that said, we will stand on the principles of God. Same words, so it's a different perspective. And then I heard God saying, if I can use Bermuda to herald that, why can't I use Bermuda to herald other things to the world that says, there is an island in the middle of Atlantic that says what God says is true, and that we don't care what the world says, we are going to stand on it. And then, Dan, I went to sleep. Now, this is, this is significant because when Dan comes to our our small group, he always tells us that God speaks to him through dreams. And I'm like, God has never spoken to me through a dream. So I went to sleep. And I had this vivid dream, vivid dream of revival happening in Bermuda, of people coming into not just this church, but churches all around Bermuda and crying and repenting and asking God to change their lives. And I had this vision of a different, of, of a new Bermuda where God's word and his principles reigned. And it was just so vivid. And I got so excited. But then God said, revival does not start in the hearts of the unbelievers. It starts in the hearts of believers. And then he said, Abbasidi, tell your church that if that's going to happen, if the vision that I have allowed you to see is going to happen, then what needs to happen first is the church needs to take God seriously. And I almost felt like up to now we haven't. You know how you take God seriously? You honor him. And you take him at his word. If he says something, it is true, you stand on it, no matter what anybody else says. And he says, the precursor to what you saw in your dream is the church taking me seriously. And, and the implication I got was, up until now, we haven't. We don't really expect to see what we read about in the Bible. How many of you expect to see God adding to the church daily with, like he did in the book of Acts? Can God do it? Well, if he can do it, shouldn't it be expected? How many of you see God doing miraculous healings? You expect to see it. If he says he can do it, shouldn't we believe it and expect it? And so here's what God brought to my mind. So today we're going to be discussing honor. But if we're going to take God seriously, we need to do it in every single one of the five principles that we are considered. How do we take God seriously in rescue? Here's what God says. 
For in Romans chapter 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here's what this means. God is in heaven waiting for people to call on his name so that he can save them. That's God. Seriously, that's how seriously he takes this whole thing. He is in heaven waiting for people to call on his name so that he can save them. But then look what he says. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And he sends us. And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who will bring good news. If we are going to take God seriously, we need to get serious about ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. And I think if we, if we spend... 12 months or a whole year, and we have not ministered the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone, we don't take God seriously. Because he says he is waiting in heaven to, for people to call on his name, but he says, how can they possibly do that if every one of you keeps quiet about me? How? And then God says this, some of you have jacked up feet. You have corns, you have bunions, you have all manner of things in your feet, you know, you have... But God says, if you deliver the gospel, I will give you a spiritual pedicure and your feet look beautiful to me. I want my feet to look beautiful to God. He tells me how. I minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. That's how I know I am taking God seriously. If we never do it, church, I tell you, we're not taking God at his word. And therefore, all the other things that he wants to do, is waiting for us to do what we're supposed to do. Connect. Acts chapter 2. All the believers, listen to this connection. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. There's no need in them because they take care of it. That's how connected they are. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord, now this line comes after these, right? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So here's what God says. God says, when you guys connect, it does something um, to the hearts of everybody who's looking. And look at how these people take care of each other. Look at how they minister to each other. And then God looks at that group and says, that's somebody, that's a group of people who I want to add to. So God says, I will add to your number when you start seriously taking this thing of ministering to each other and connecting. So if we're going to take God seriously, that's what we need to do. And if we take God seriously, look what he does. Grow. Ephesians chapter 4. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow, be, we will grow to become in every respect a mature body of him who is head, that is Christ. For him, for him, the whole body joined together, held together by every, every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. God says, if you take me seriously and you desire to grow, then what's going to happen is as individuals, you will grow to reflect my glory. And then what will happen is you will grow together such that you, you're going to be mature and you're going to actually begin to build each other up. Serve. Ephesians chapter 4 again. So, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of Christ. The fullness of Christ. Don't you want to be that as a body? The whole measure of Christ. The fullness of Christ. And today we consider honor. We understand this principle because in scripture we are told that there are certain people we should honor, right? The Bible tells us we should honor our parents. And you know what's funny about this whole word honor? You kind of like the verse based on who you are, you know? Honor your parents. Parents love that verse. Children, not so much. But then it tells you to honor your elders, right? Then it tells you to honor those who are above you in the Lord. And those who are above you in the Lord, I like that verse. And those who aren't you, oh, I'm not so sure I like that verse. 
But we are told in Scripture that we are supposed to honor people based on the position they hold and also based on their value. But the primary person that we are told to honor in Scripture is God. The primary person that we are told to honor in Scripture is God. And we are told to honor God in a number of ways. We are supposed to honor him with our time. How you spend your time will determine whether or not you honor God. We are told to honor him with our treasures, right? How you spend your money, and the Bible makes this clear, where your treasure is, where your heart is, how you spend your money will determine whether or not you honor God. The next one is your temple. What you do with your body, whether it's sexually, whether it's exercise, whether it's diet. I mean, um, we are told to honor God with our bodies. And then the final one is our talents, what we do with our gifts. We are told to honor God with our talents. So here's what this, the definition, the kind of definition of what this word honor means. Honor means to highly esteem or, res or, or respect it, to view in high regard as to, look at these two words, worth, value, rank, character, or, or merit. We're going to focus on those two words, worth and value. Now, the thing about God is he is infinitely valuable. But what happens oftentimes in our lives, God has to compete with other, thing, other things to, for us to demonstrate to him whether or not he is worth, mo worth more than these things or he is valuable to us more than these things. And I'm going to show you that every single day we make decisions based on value. For instance, if you're walking down the street and you have $50 in your pocket, right, you have a decision to make on what you can spend it on. And you will spend it on whatever you think is valuable. Now imagine if somebody has $50 and they are hungry as anything. You know, they're really, really hungry. Right? So you would think, what, what should they spend it on? Food. But if that person goes and spends it on something else, they go and buy the latest whatever CD, then even though they were hungry, the thing that is most valuable to them at that time is that CD. And here's the point I'm trying to make. We don't always make good decisions with regard to value. We don't. If you are dying and the doctor tells you you can save your life by doing this, then the most significant thing, to you, the most valuable thing to, to you should be your life, right? But I know people who have been told if you continue to drink vodka, you will die. So now they have to make a decision about value. Which one is more valuable to them, their life or a drink? And I know several people who actually value the drink over their life and are not with us today. Now here's the thing. As Christians, God is asking us to make value judgments. You can either make a judgment which says you value God or you value something else. And oftentimes, like those people who have made decisions to drink and die, we select this something else over God. Now, here's a concept of value. We decide what is valuable to us. Anybody know who he is? Stephon Marbury. Yes. You've just shown your age. All right, so Stephon Marbury was a very good basketball player back in the day, right? He played for New Jersey. He played for some other teams, right? But here's what Stephon Marbury did. He said to make a quantity pair of sneakers cost very little money. So why are these guys selling the sneakers for $250 when to make them cost maybe 12? So Stefan Marbury made a line of sneakers that cost between 15 and $45. Same quantity as Air Jordans and all of them. So here's Stefan Marbury's sneaker. Here's Michael Jordan's sneaker. One cost 15 to $45, the other costs 250 to 300. I don't know how much Jordans cost. Oh yes, I have an example. Somebody bought a pair of Air Jordans for two year olds, I think. Two year olds. Two year olds. It's about 70, 70, I'm sorry, about 70 cents worth of leather in there. Right, the things are this big. They were $70 a pop. Sneakers for a two-year-old cost more than these, right? But whose do you think sold most? 
So what, here's what the world says. The world, we, here's what we said. We said, Stefan, you make quality sneakers just as quality as these, but we value these more than these. Why? Because they're better? No. Because of a name. So the only reason, so whilst these are worth the same, we have decided that these are worth, what is that? I'm trying to do multiplication in my, a lot more. I should have got this because I'm doing multiplication with my daughter right now. But a lot more, several times more. Now think about it. Think about the reasons we've decided this. Now you have to understand something. To you, value is created by you. It emanates from your heart and you decide what you honor. You decide what you want. Every day, you decide what you want. That's why every day, we should wake up and ask this question, God, how can I honor you today? We should ask it. LeBron James' sneakers. Stefan Marbury's, $15. LeBron James, $150. Made out of the same things, but we have decided that just because his name is associated with it, then then we should spend much more. So, 10 times, thank you. <laughs> did you do that in your head or did you, did you go on your phone? <laughs> oh yes, yes, this one's on, yes, thank you, thank you. All right. Lord help my daughter. So, Now, now, here's the thing, equal, really equal in value. No difference in value, no difference in quality, no difference in material. But we have decided we will pay 10 times more for these. Now, if everybody in the world says, I'm not paying $150 for these sneakers, what has to happen? Price has to drop and the value changes. We have decided. See, we think the, the people who put the, put the price tag on it decide. We decide. Every time we buy one, we decide. And every time we buy a pair of these and others, we are saying to us, these are valuable to us. And that's what honor is all about. And often, what happens is, God has to compete with regard to honor. Now think about it. If you take God seriously, if you take him at his word, if you believe that who he says he is, if you believe that everything we have, everything that was ever created was, was given by him, if you believe that there is no life without him, if you believe that there's no breath in your lungs without him, then how could anything else in your life be elevated above him? But I'm telling you that the potential to do that exists in you and much more than you think. That's why we need to take this thing about honoring him very seriously. All right. With regard to worth, is God worthy of our honor? Here's what the Bible has to say about it in Revelation chapter 4. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy our Lord and God to receive. Now, see if you ever thought, if you ever struggled with whether or not Jesus is God, this is being said to Jesus. And what does it say? Our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So here's what this is saying. Nothing would have its being without God. So everybody, even if they don't acknowledge God, everybody owes everything to God. Now, there are some people who don't accept him as personal savior, who don't acknowledge him, who actually fight against him. But, and for them not to honor God, that's one thing. But for those of us who say we love him, for those of us who say he is our everything, for us not to honor him, that's a different prospect altogether. Now, it says... You are worthy. That whole thing about worth has been taken out right there. Um, and, and the thing is, some of the other things that we honor, they're not worthy at all. To receive 
Glory and honor. There's a big difference between these two words, all right? Here's what glory means, to give him glory. Glory speaks of God's inherent or intrinsic, intrinsic value. We glorify him by accurately displaying his character. So here's what this means. This means that God is worthy of glory. He is intrinsically valuable. And if every person on the earth decided that he wasn't, it wouldn't change anything, he still is. God is valuable. It has nothing to do with whether or not we say he's valuable. It has nothing to do with whether or not we say he's not valuable. He is. And that never changes. Honor is quite different. Okay, so that's glory. Honor is quite different. Honor emanates from our hearts and refers to the value we personally place on something or someone. The value we personally place on something or someone. Now, this is not the value we place on something or someone by what we say. This is the value we place on something or someone by what we do. Because suppose I say to my wife, I love you. You are important to me. And then I forget her birthday. I forget our anniversary. Um, then I spent, then, uh, let's say then I spend time with some other woman. It doesn't matter what I say. What really demonstrates whether or not I honor her or I love her is what I do. And we say, God, I honor you. And oftentimes we do things that suggest we don't. And so here's what we need to do in order to take God seriously. What, decide in our minds that from today forward, I will honor God with my life. Because whether you worship something or not is not what you sing. It is a life thing. And so what God is asking is, that we would understand that he is intrinsically value, valuable, and then that our lives would reflect that we would believe that. You know how they say one man's trash is another man's treasure? This is what we're talking about here. All of us view different things um, with different value. Like some of us value certain football teams over another. <laughs> and my team lost 5-1 yesterday, so right now... I'm even, why are you clapping? <laughs> ushers, ushers, over here. <sighs> All right, forget that, let's move on. So we value things differently, right? But here's the thing, all of us come together on a Sunday and on a Tuesday because we say we honor God. Now what God is asking us to do is don't just come together and say that you honor me. I want you through Monday through Friday to demonstrate that you love me. And we're going to talk about three areas in which we can honor God in our lives. First one, honoring God at work. And we're going to look at work as worship. Now, I talked earlier about how we view things just considering our story. And here's how we, the opinion we have of work that just considers our story goes like this. Work is a necessity that needs to be endured to put bread on the table. That's why I work. If that is my, if that is my, uh, that is how I view my work, then you know what happens to us? We have one mindset in church, because I come here to honor God, and then a completely different mindset at work. Right? If we have this mindset, we walk in on Monday morning like this. Oh, oh it's Monday, five days. How am I going to get through this week? This, my stupid boss. And last week on Fridays, uh, Sanaya went in the fridge and ate my lunch. I hate this place. And then Friday at five comes and we are like, hey! Right? Why are we like this? Because of the view that we have of our work, which has absolutely nothing to do with honoring God. Now, isn't God, doesn't God want to be honored outside of the church? Right? If you look at Jesus' ministry and his miracles, do you know where they were all done, most of them? In the marketplace, not in the church. Jesus was all about being in those places. So here's a mindset that we should have when we go to work. A place where God is to be honored and made known. 
I walk into my job on Monday morning to do the work, yes, but it is a place where I go to honor God and to make him known to people. That's why I go there. See, that's the difference about viewing it just based on our little story and but rather intertwining our lives with the big story of God and what he is trying to do on this earth. You can walk in there just thinking about how it affects you or you can walk in there thinking about how it could affect the kingdom of God. Completely different mindset. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. We need to understand some things about work. It says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to make and to take care of it. I've heard some people talking about work. Work is part of the curse. That God gave it to us to just so we would understand and it's labor and it's toil. This was given before the curse. Adam was supposed to work before the curse. No, it says that work became harder after the curse. Now, some of you are saying, they're looking at me, and I could tell, I could tell exactly who's thinking this. They're looking at me and saying, you know, you have it easy. Because your work, what do you do? You study the Bible to get ready for things like this. You work around all people who are Christians. And you, you know, your, your work is easy. I understand how you can honor God, but I am an accountant. Like, how am I supposed to honor God in this? I am, a, I am an underwriter. My job is based on disasters. How am I supposed to honor God in that? I, I, I am a truck driver. How am I supposed to honor God in this? Well, if there is no way that we can honor God in our work, then we may as well forget about honoring God. And one of the re reasons we struggle with how we can honor God is because there are some things in our Christian experience that we have defined terribly, and we don't even understand what they are. One is calling. Whenever I hear people talk about calling, it's usually somebody going on a mission field or something to do with church. Can I tell you what you are called to? You are called by Jesus to his work. Right? We are hardly ever, you know what we should be doing? Oh, you're an accountant? I'm going to lay hands on you because you have been called to the place that you, you're going to on Monday. I'm going to say we wouldn't do this to an accountant because it doesn't seem spiritual. We do this to somebody who's going to do something spiritual, but what if we did it to accountants so that accountants could recognize that their job is not just what they do, but it's also a spiritual thing? And if you don't believe me, turn in your Bibles to Exodus 31. Exodus 31. Strange, you don't hear pages turning anymore, you just, because everybody's flicking on their phones and stuff. It's weird. Oh, I heard a few pages. Yes, everybody, these things still exist. Books. We still have them. <laughs> Listen to this. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of, Uri, son of Uri, and son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Now, immediately we're thinking, okay, this man's been filled with the Spirit of God. What's, what spiritual thing is he being sent to do? Like, what is he, he must be going to go witness to? He must be going to preach a good sermon. Listen to what it says after that. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. What? He filled him with the Spirit to do that? What do you need the spirit for for that? Right? To cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. That blew my mind when I saw that. The man got filled with the spirit to work. Now listen. Because we don't understand this calling thing, we ask God to fill us with the Spirit for a lot of things, but we don't ask Him to fill us with the Spirit because we are going to work and in a place where He needs to be honored. I'm telling you what you need to do now before you go in your, works, your workplace, say, God, I need to be filled with the Spirit so that when I walk into this place, I honor you. Here's our typical prayer. Lord, get me through this day. I'm a school teacher, Lord, and so I want to finish the day without killing one of these students. 
Because if, if that little boy who sits in the back down the, down the right says anything today, Lord, I, I swear I'm going to snatch him. <laughs> That's our prayer. But think about that prayer. You know what that is? It's a prayer concerned with our little story, forgetting about the fact that we have young people in front of us every day as a school uh, teacher who we can influence with the, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ask anybody who was at Chain Reaction what happened on this stage. They were asked a question like, how many of you have, have um, com thought about committing suicide to get away from your pain? It was 100 students and at least 40 of them crossed the line. There were, there were young men weeping. There was a young man in my group, when it came to his time to share, he didn't say anything, he just cried. You, you have children who are sitting in front of you every day who are waiting for somebody to demonstrate to them that there is a God who cares. And all we're, all we're thinking about is get me through the day. Honor God at work. You will not honor God at work unless you walk in there with a mentality that this is a place where I can. And for most of us, we walk into our work thinking, no, this ain't a place where I can honor God. Colossians chapter 3, verse, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. So, if we're going to honor God, one of the things that has to happen is we have to work with the, the highest moral and ethical standards. You can't be the person who thinks that showing up 15 minutes is late is, is okay because everybody else does it. Because you want to honor God. And then it says, as working for the Lord, not human masters, since you know it says if we're going to do this, we have to know something. Here's what we have to know. That you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So there's two things you have to know. Who you're serving, not primarily your boss. You're serving God. And also that he will reward you. Because if we don't do it, it suggests that we don't know these things the way that we should. Honor God at work. Second one. Honoring God with our giving. Who is your master? Matthew chapter 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. It's always interesting to me that when Jesus tried to, to um, get us to see how we can be pulled in a different direction away from him and something else could be equal to him in our hearts, this is what he uses. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other or you will be devoted to one, devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So here's basically what this is saying. If we want to take God seriously, then we have to get to, up, get to a place where we give what he puts on our hearts to give. Because one of the things that we'll do is suggest to God that I believe that you are my provider. Can I tell you that one of the things that I struggle with, believing God, that he is, is my provider. I like to hoard up money. My wife and I, uh, um, we're different. I like to save money. I like to have it all put aside. And I like to know that if I live to 90, I have enough money to cover it. And if the, and if the number goes beneath a certain thing, I get panicked. Why? Because I struggle to trust God as provider. And you know what God will say to me? If you're going to take me seriously, if you're going to take me at my word, then even when the, the number goes beneath that and I prompt you to give, you need to do it. Because if not, you're not taking me seriously. Now, look what this says. This is Deuteronomy 8.18. But re remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. If you have an ability to produce wealth, it comes from him. You thought you were sharp all by yourself. You thought you were brilliant all by yourself. But he says, if you have any ability to produce any wealth, it comes from me. So don't get all haughty about it. Rather, thank him for it. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So you thank him for it, but you also give in order to acknowledge who he is. He is your provider. And the last one, honoring God with your worship. That says worship. Let's imagine it in your mind. Worship him in spirit and in truth. So this is the other thing, honoring God with our worship. Okay? So Jesus says to, a, to, this, to this woman, yet a, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So it says our worship has to be based on truth. 
and it is spirit to spirit. So they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is a spirit, and his worshipers worship him in spirit and in truth. This is what it means. It means that when we engage in worship, there has to be something about God and the truth of who he is that we are contemplating, and then we are engaging in. Worship is just not singing a song and being happy about the tune. It is understanding what you are, what you are singing and what it is saying about God and about who he is, and then you really engaging him as you do it. Final thought. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably, acceptingly. Now listen to this. With reverence and awe. There's supposed to be awe when we worship God. Like there's supposed to be this thing. Have you ever seen, you ever seen something that made your jaw just drop and you were like, man, man. I remember the first time when I, when I told my wife I was interested in her. Um, it was a terrifying time for me. Um, <clears throat> I weren't like this before because I was never serious about a woman before. So it wasn't scary, but this time it was somebody who I was serious about, and I went into her house, and I was shaking. And I tried five times to tell her, and I couldn't. And um, she was just there smiling. She wouldn't give me any help. <laughs> she knew exactly what I was trying to do, because she told me later on, and she just found it was cute. I didn't find it cute at all. And then my heart started beating. You know when your heart beats and you can feel it? Like, and then, like, like, my sweat glands opened and stuff started pouring down. So then I finally tell her. And then I remember she said, I can't remember exactly, but she said something like, I like you too. <laughs> Knowing me and how unlikable I am, my jaw went like this. What? <laughs> and there was this awe. Like, I was like, man, I've hit the jackpot here. Like, this is like. God, you are amazing. You must have knocked out in her sleep and told her, you need to marry this guy. But you know that feeling, like when you see something. I've seen some things on a football field or on a basketball court and it made me go, man. God says if we really engage him in worship, as we're singing a song, we'd be contemplating the word and going, man. We'd be singing, I am a friend of God. How is that possible? Me, a friend of God. We'll be singing, he's my way maker. And we will be reflecting on times when he made a way. And we will be engaging him going, man. There would be awe, oh, man. And so, bottom line for today. God is saying, it is time for us to take God seriously. It's time for us to take God seriously. You know why? Because he takes us seriously. He takes us so seriously that he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross to demonstrate to us how much he loves us. And everything he wants to do in and through us, he takes seriously. And he is waiting for us to take him seriously so that we could be at the place where he can add to us daily. Where he can say, look at these people, they take me seriously. And I believe based on what I experienced with God this week that he wants to do this. Let's stand together. We're going to have a very different type of invitation today. No music. If there is some area in your life where you need to take God seriously, you need to take God seriously, and it could be something like, I need to get to prayer meeting. I need to take God seriously, and I need to bring somebody to next week to hear Alonzo's testimony. Or I need to take God seriously and honor him at my job. I need to take God seriously in my worship, in my giving, whatever it is. If there is some area of your life where you need to take God seriously, I'm going to ask you to come. This is not going to be a long invitation. I'm going to ask you to come right now, and then we are going to pray, and we're going to spend some time worshiping God and just in awe of him. So if that is you, if there's an area of your life that you need to take God seriously, and I'm going to ask you to come right now. You know, one of the ways we can take God seriously is by worshiping him no matter where we find ourselves. Whether it's in a difficult time, whether it's in a hard time, we worship him. Father, I thank you for these people and I pray that you will allow us to take you seriously, God, in 2018. Because when we do, 
the results are that you do what you said you would do. Lord, whatever area it is in, I pray that we would all understand that you are God, your word is true, and we would take you seriously and stand on your word. Thank you, Lord, today that there is no doubt in our minds that you are worthy of our praise. But God, help us on the days in which we struggle to live like that is true. God, you give us all power and everything we need. So God, I pray that we would stop just looking at our lives based on our little story. And then when we do that, we look at our little resources. But God, help us to see our story from the point of view of the kingdom of heaven. And then we can access heaven's resources when they are needed. So today, God, we pray that we would leave this place taking you seriously, taking you at your word, that if you said that you are a provider, if you said that you are a healer, if you said that you are everything we need, we would believe it. If you said if you would just speak to people about me, then I would work in their hearts to cause them to come to me. If you said, God, that if we would just do your work amongst each other, you would build us up and grow us up into the fullness of Christ. Help us to take you seriously. Thank you, Lord, for today. Help us to leave encouraged and ready to do your work in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our service is over. Hug each other and encourage each other. Look each other in the face and say today, I'm going to take God seriously. This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm. Or if you have a prayer request, email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm